Mr. Merlin Mar Johnson. How are we, sir? Very well, thanks, Matt. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Are you recovered and well from your trip to Toronto land? I am recovered and well. It took longer than I thought to recover. My liver took a beating and the sleep defer- deprivation kicked in after a while. Yeah. Did so. A lot less drinking. I was very well behaved because um, the workload was rather onerous. I was hollied. Well, um, the, uh, yes, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I, I was hollied before, as you? well. I was out of pretty full agenda. Um, uh, and I didn't drink that much, but I'm just such a lightweight that if I drink every day, that counts for me as, um, as a lot. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Holly, for those who do, being hollied is basically the, the young lady who sets up all of these meetings, doesn't care what time we have to get up or go to sleep or do in between, like things like eat or go to the toilets, we get back-to-back meetings. So it was a little bit full-on from that one. But more of that in a minute. We're going to talk about some of the companies that we um, saw, what we heard, what we liked, and so forth. But um, I thought we'd kind of start sort of back to front, as it were. I'd like to hear what you um, took away from PDAC this year. Because I haven't been for 10 years, right? I have to say, when I was in banking, I hated coming to PDAC. It was too cold. There were too many people. There were not enough restaurants uh, to, to uh, go to because they were all booked up. But those are the days where they talked about having 25,000, 30,000 people there. Felt a lot less than that this time around. But nevertheless, um, lots, of, lots of fun had and lots of uh, nice to see, see people. But what were your kind of key takeaways? And maybe we can talk about some of the companies in, on, in the backdrop of some of those thoughts. Uh, absolutely. And I agree with you that uh, there are lots of people and possibly too many people, but my goodness, it's good to see everyone. Um, I think the numbers were 23,000 this year, but that was just a number I heard. I don't know if that's an official number. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Uh, we, we, we can we can look it up. Yeah. As for the kind of my observations or my takeaways from PDAC, I, I, I actually put pen to paper and I wrote a list of seven things, which I um, stuck up on, on LinkedIn. But I just wrote a couple of lines on each one of those. Um, but we'll, we've got the, the luxury of being able to expand on that. But um, if I just start with kind of the main observation, uh, the first thing that I, I noticed was that the, the market was, is pretty beaten up. Um, lots of uh, crushed valuations, uh, share prices, you know, down a long way from the peak in 2021 or 2020 or 2022. Many, many people I, I think the feature of last year was uncertainty it felt bad but we didn't know whether it's going to get worse or whether it's going to get better this year it feels as if this is rock bottom it can't get any worse um and i, I you know that, that line you know when you're in the alcoholics anonymous um phrase is you know once you've hit rock bottom at least you know that the only way from there is up um well of course or, or death but, um, <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> but that's what I felt when I was looking at some of these companies and talking to some of these CEOs. It was like, uh, it, it, it felt like sort of uh, palliative care. You know, <laughs> this was yeah. the last time I'd see them in their current form because they were cash strapped, didn't know where to go to get money, not that it was on offer, quite frankly, and just crawling to get to PDAC in the hope that someone would say, hey, why don't we merge? That might get us some money, might pay the salaries yeah. for a bit longer. That's kind of what it felt like with the, I'm talking about the smaller Explore, explore Co's um, with not much of an asset and not much to say. You're absolutely right. And that's exactly what I sent um, for Saw as well. Um, I, I also feel that in mingled in with that fatalism was a kind of a degree of optimism that, that uh, people in the sector are generally quite optimistic. But it was like, this surely cannot go on for much longer there has to be a bounce and uh if you um my the, my kind of second takeaway from pdac was that if you look at these kind of supply demand fundamentals and you see something which is in sustained deficit and then that there's buying which is, has to come into the market because market you know the, the, that that kind of long-term demand exists then you get a price response but it can take longer than you want and it can be slower than you hope. And there's that kind of famous John Maynard Keynes um, expression that markets can remain uh, irrational for much longer than you can remain solvent. Um, but the, the uranium move of 2023 and 2024 kind of shows that the, the theory does work. And the gold price move in, uh, while we were there, actually during PDAC, the gold price spiked to $150 per ounce and kind of started to nudge towards 2200 That kind of shows you that when there's this unlimited 
kind of quantitative easing and devaluation of the paper currency, sound money will respond. And it, we, we say it forever and ever, and then people think, oh, it's never going to happen. But when it does happen, that's really reassuring. And obviously, the other one that I've been talking about is copper, because you've got very, very long-term demands, growing demands. You've got this kind of new sources of demand, which is kind of an additional 20% on that demand load, and you've got your supply constraints. So it kind of makes me think that the supply-demand fundamental analysis does work. Uranium proved it. Gold is in the process, and copper is probably next. Yeah, well, I, th- I, th- I think the the only kind of excitement during the week was the fact that gold went up 150 bucks during the course of the week, most unexpectedly, along with Bitcoin. So the develop the producers were very pleased because that just added free money to that bottom line. Effectively, fair enough. Um, developers were excited because they thought, oh, that means there might be a few acquisitions. Um, to be to to be seen in the next next coming coming months as as cash reserves build up with the, with the producers. But in fact, we <laughs> do you know what? Here's a slide aside. We're going to bounce around a bit here today, guys. But but it's all kind of feedback and takeaways. So I was sitting with having dinner with Carora with the director from Carora Resources when in came the news that an Australian gold producer uh, had been in discussion or is in discussion with them. Um, that was not a Freudian slip, but it's like he's, he's in discussion with them uh, to talk about buying buying them, right? And I, I think those discussions have been in place for you know six months or so, kind of getting to the final hard yards. But some an Aussie journalist working for the Australian Financial Times um, had basically found out, published it with a lot of detail and um, data, which is not available in the public, which suggests that the bankers yet again have been the modicum of indiscretion and and goodness know how she's extracted that data from them. I hope it was just a small drink. You never know. Um, I don't know how these things work. I was never asked when I was a banker. I would never have dreamt of doing anything. But um, anyway, so this broke in the middle of my dinner and um, the director had to trot off and try and deal with this most unexpected news. But I think there'll be a lot more of that. And I think there have been conversations going on for a while as some of these, these gold producers are trying to sort of build up their reserves uh, once again. That's quite interesting thing you said because the, um, in the chat rooms, it seemed that the the retail or whoever were kind of accusing Carora of no. Kind of leaking it and kind of um, pumping, you know, uh, pump priming the market. Could not be further from the truth. I mean, I've, I've spoken with management, no, the directors, right? I've spoken with Paul, I've spoken with um, uh, Oliver. Um, I've, he's quite clear to me, they were fuming. I mean, genuinely fuming because it, it, it does a few things when this news breaks, it, it kind of unpicks a lot of work that's gone on in the previous six months. It certainly da- damages the deal. It may even cause the deal to be reconstructed in, 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 a, in a different form, or it may be terminal. So I don't want to do business with people like this. So it was definitely 100% not coming from Carora's side. This is, this, I don't know, too far, I think this journalist has broken three other stories like this in the same way before it was public information. So I think the perhaps the um, this the the exchange and the uh, Australian financial authority need to tighten up on on this kind of thing because that's it's it, you know if, if, if I was a big shareholder in Corora and this deal falls over, I'd be kind of super pissed right I would be right who am I suing? Like, let me let me work that. That's the first port of call. I mean, the fact that I think gold price broke at 150, maybe there's a kind of silver silver lining to this in the sense that, well, actually, this deal looks different now. On you know, because a 30 day VWAP pre PDA looked like very different from what it could do in in a month's time, right? We, we shall see. But 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 yeah, no, I, I like chat, chat rooms do like to make things up and cast aspersions without necessarily knowing the facts. But a bit of um, just ask us a few simple questions. I will try. Just on that, well, um, I, I wonder if that journalist has got um, considerable personal attractions, which enables um, that journalist journalist to break these new She's new probably stories. very, very capable and has a large reputation uh, in the sector. Good. Um, just uh, from the industry's... 
um, from the industry side of things, um, exploration geologists and the teams that work with them are generally kind of trained to be discreet and not to talk about uh, good drill holes before they come out and not to front run um, assay data. And you can see that in companies which are leaky, you can see that their share price runs before the news yeah. is announced. And oh, you can always. see the ones you can see the ones which are um, disciplined and that they put the news out and then there's a response. And I think the majority are pretty well behaved and, and disciplined. And that's that's a training right through industry. And the, the, the shonkier end of activity is the, the price moves before the drill release we've, comes out. We've seen it all too many times, and it's, so, and it's so obvious. And quite frankly, the exchanges need to kind of step up here. This is, you know, front-running 101. Um, I dislike it. Never done it. Um, I, don't, I don't like seeing it being done either. But just sticking with the the rise in the gold price, and, you know, you referenced uranium there. It obviously went on a bit of a run up to about six bucks from, you know, sort of, 50 bucks earlier in the year 30 bucks 18 months ago it's really been on on a tear but it's kind of it's kind of come off again um back down to 85 so you know losing 20 bucks in the course of a week um quite something well two weeks sorry two weeks it, quite, quite something are there lessons to be learned there we've we, we saw what happened with uranium previously 18 months ago now we've seen it with uranium gold bugs are well, what are they, what should they expect? Okay, there, there, there are two things here. One is for the investor, you know, um, do you want to trade around a kind of a, a metal price and sh a short-term share price? I'll let you answer that. But if I can just kind of speak about from the industry side of things, um, and in fact, this is my third takeaway point, so we're kind of, we're coming back on track, but, uh, um, is that different companies are kind of um, have got very different responses or kind of have had a very different experience in, in in the last 15 months or so. So the majority of the uranium companies that I met were well-funded. You know, they had used the buoyant market, the rising um, short-term price or the, the rising spot price to um, build their treasury to kind of speak to shareholders over a number of months or investors and then to do a capital raise. And so they're all sitting relatively are, um, you know, in, in a comfortable position with funds to drill. And so for them, the short-term price move of $20 a pound isn't, isn't, a, um, isn't a big deal. But, you know, the long-term fundamentals have remained positive. The incentive price for uh, new uh, production is probably well north of um, $80 a pound. It's probably $140 a pound or $160 or $120, but whatever it is, it's it's a long way above spot. So the, the fundamentals of uranium price haven't changed. And they've got now got their funds required to do their exploration drilling or their technical studies or the next phase of work that they're, they're working on. So the uranium companies are kind of fine. The rise in the gold price and now subsequently the, the copper price matches what I saw on the floor, which is almost every copper and gold company that I saw was doing a one or a one, two, three, four or five million dollar capital raise. I mean, almost without exception, particularly when they're sub $50 million market cap. So all of the small guys were looking to uh, refinance, including Fitzroy Minerals, you know, that I, I, I'm, I'm running at the moment. You know, Who, say that name again? Fitzroy Minerals. Sounds Just lovely. Get, it's lovely. <laughs> but, you know, we're doing a private placement at the moment and... Yes. Um, we we hit our million dollars, and I think uh, the window is open for the gold and copper companies in the short term. The the guys who were really struggling and kind of looking as if kind of a stun grenade had just kind of gone off on them near their heads were the nickel and the lithium C CEOs, who were just kind of whoa 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 kind of where are we? And they were bravely putting on a kind of um, the market's not so bad, the price is coming back a bit. Um, okay, we might be down whatever we are. 80-90% over the year but um, uh, it's going to be alright and then they'd kind of almost ask yourself, you know, ask me you know, isn't it? You know, with a question in there um, so it's very different commodity to commodity and it is. these windows open up when you can get funding for a certain commodity and at the moment it feels like it's the time for copper and gold. It does, it does I mean, you copper, I saw copper is up at 405, 406 today, yeah. something yeah. like that um, up from sort of mid three eighties um, for the, for the last while, um, 
no, it's not big, but it's it's, it's a start. And I think every I th- that's what I found. Maybe because I was sitting there with a copper project, we were sitting there with a copper project, and in Toronto, people were talking copper to us and at us. But even the people who didn't know, um, and even the companies we we weren't there to meet regards to copper, were talking and seeing copper as an investment on a PA basis. So I, that's kind of encouraging. I think encouraging the thematic yeah. s- still holds. It's, it- it's those um, when every everybody can see a sustained supply demand deficit, uh, as in there's a shortage in the market, uh, kind of a structural uh, shortage, and that's when you get the price response, as we saw in uranium, currently in gold, and um, hopefully this the start of something in copper. Yeah, and, I, and so, so, I mean, if we're talking anecdotal here, I, I was speaking with a guy called Mike, Professor Michael Moats um, from Missouri University Tech. University and he he's a metallurgical engineer. That's his thing, best in the world. His own words. Uh, so you know, solves problems, and that's what he's known for. In fact, I met him on one of these sort of soft gen sessions that we did last year on copper, um, and he, he was you know it went down quite well. He's just talking about the di- the difficulty that some of these companies are facing in terms of not just the finding of copper, right? So there's there's a bunch of good projects out there. But the ability to do it economically at these prices, okay, well, there's a solution for that. Copper price goes up and solves that problem. There's the problem technical, technically to rec- recover um, copper at, um, at levels which um, you know, will, will help in terms of those, those economics. Um, and the fact that his, and then he sort of went off, it's very clear. He said, these are my views or the university's views, or anyone else's view who's, who uh, sponsors me in, the, in this uh, position. I said, the problem that mines more broadly are facing is social license to be able to uh, get the stuff out of the ground. He was quite down on the US government's... Um, but I said, you know, is the US government um, helping miners? Is it, or is it all just talk? And he said, like, quite simply, no, they're not. So it's getting harder for companies to get the stuff out of the ground. Um, and that's going to be a problem in terms of the supply deficit. We talked about, you know, the the demand fundamentals, et cetera, copper. He's saying if you can get a copper project with good grades in the right jurisdiction, and you think you can get this out of the ground, then um, you'll be one of the very few. So, Absolutely. And you may recall that when I um, interviewed Mark Bristow six months ago or seven uh, months ago, um, I asked him, you know, would he consider diversifying out of, or just kind of fo- instead of having this kind of global diversified um, business, I said, would you just kind of consider having a kind of a North American business just to get that, uh, perhaps an improved credit rating, uh, to have that a kind of a lower jurisdictional risk kind of right through the portfolio? And he stopped me and he said, man, have you tried building a mine in Canada, in North America recently? Uh-huh. He said, it's so hard. He says he can get a mine permitted and um, developed in many other countries much more easily than you can, say, in Australia or um, in um, North America. And that is why Chile is such a good place to operate, because it's mining is in the lifeblood. And as long as you're not mining or looking to move a glacier or be in a national park, basically, it's kind of national parks and glaciers are the kind of things you really want to avoid. Um, it's, it's a It's a superb place to um, be exploring and developing assets, but that's us talking our own book, I and mean, that's one of the it reasons is why a we're bit, there. It is a bit salmon streams everywhere. Um, right. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Can I just go back yeah. to one of your other points about the um, the professor of the metallurgical engineering? Yeah, yeah. Michael Mounts. Um, Michael Mounts. He was talking about the challenges that mining companies have in re- leaching hydrometallurgical leaching of sulfides. So typically what you've done in the past is you, when you've got a sulfide is you whack it into a, um, into a pyrometallurgical process and you basically burn the mineral and you break the bond between the, the sulfur and the, the metal. Are you with me? I, I hear you. Hydrometallurgy typically only works for oxides and carbonates. But what, they're, what we're, the, the mining companies are looking for, the kind of the holy grail, which is what Oh, what's the name of that company that begins with a V? <laughs> Victoria Coles? <laughs> no, 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 the leaching company, the private uh, leaching company. Oh. Um, and um, and uh, Newton, all of these guys, um, the, the, um, Atalaya with their Elix process, um, 
all of these um, guys are looking to uh, do the leaching at uh, atmospheric condition and pressure without pressure oxidation, without bio-oxidation. They're looking for a holy grail way of leaching sulfides. He's he said that you know they're struggling with this, and the, the the and he says it's his views. But a huge paper has been done on this. You know, a, a big in Chile in the in the the main university in Chile, they've done a review of all of these processes, and they've concluded that without elevating the pressure or the acidity or the temperature to the point where you're just running autoclaves and doing a lot of pre work, you can't leach self. Um, you can't leach copper from that copper sulfide mineral you get incremental gains not evolutionary gains and at low grades you can't afford to do the autoclaves or the roasting or the pressure oxidation so grade really matters and m- mineralogy really matters right he did talk about that Fraser it's definitely worth watching um that session with him and he's, he said he'd come back and do a more technical session which i'm sure you'd love to dive into with him with regards to metallurgical recoveries etc um Shall shall we shall we skip on? Move on. There's otherwise going to be a, a long one here, okay? And I, and I talked about this this morning on a couple of shows that I did, and it's and I'm I maybe I kind of thought about it. So maybe I'm I'm sounding too um, dismissive and maybe um, a little bit negative on the next thing, which is ESG, environmental, ESG. social, and governance. Now, yes. What are your thoughts on that? And what do you think people were thinking at the show? Well, what I wrote and what I feel is that nobody cares about ESG in the sense that it wasn't it you can you could have the fanciest booth and the smiliest pictures and the cuddliest images and your share price could still be at, at the bottom. You know, what really mattered was the geology, the engineering, the mineralogy, the metallurgy, the the um now, obviously, that isn't to say that social license to operate isn't important. It's crucial. But the uh, the investment in telling people about it and kind of doing fancy presentations on it is seems to be too much, too fluffy for this market, and nobody really seems to care about that. What they care about is can you maintain a social license to operate and get stuff done on your project? And if you can, great. It's almost too important to talk about as kind of a it, it has to be a part of your dna of, of an operating company and you don't need to talk about it you just get on with it and you do it properly and if you fail your company fails so it's really important but no one cares no one wants to go to listen to listen to someone talking about esg they just want to know that you're operating and you're able to advance that's my view yeah no i i i'd, I'd agree with that i mean unless i think we've always said from the beginning which was like Good companies always did the things involved or pack it repackaged as ESG. You had to have good social license. You had to have good relationships on the ground with all you know key stakeholders. Kind of, God, I even hate that dragging in these bloody corporate phrases. But it's if you if you aren't able to operate in country, your project's never getting off the ground. Whether it's whether it's it doesn't matter how good it is, and that's always been the case, right? And we've seen some. Yeah, some wonderful blow ups last year. So I agree with you. It, I think investors are like, just, just show me the money. I assume all of the admin that you do, whether it be the social component, whether it be the metallurgy, whether it be, you know, good HR practice. So you're not losing your staff um, and your, you know, and how you, how you manage an efficient operation. I assume you're going to be good at that. You don't need to bang on about it. What I want to know is, how much money am I going to make? That's the top of the pyramid in terms of yeah, you know information absolutely. that they want to understand, yeah, yeah. right? So I, I, I hear you, and, and in tough times, that's especially so. You, companies sort of spending vast like, – don't get me wrong. I think companies are being forced to spend vast sums of money for various certifications and reports for the environmental component. Um, and, you know, government the mining departments are, are insisting on it. As they should, but it's getting to that point where it's got just that little bit ridiculous. Um, I, I I thought, you know, um, I've I've seen companies do a full audit and get one of these kind of internationally credited kind of ESG reviews, 
Um, and there are lots of kind of outreach programs and, and smiling photographs. And that's basically for show. And yeah. behind the scenes, on the ground, things are failing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I've it seen more it. Concerning. It was more concerning. And it's, it's, it's the wrong way around. I mean, what you should do is you should make sure that your relations with the local community work and that the project can progress. And then everything else will follow. You don't need to make a big song and dance about it. Anyway, this, this, in this market, um, in a sense, that has kind of come out in the wash. No one cares about what you say. It's about what you do. Exactly. And I, th I think it's always been I've got a great friend of mine, Richard. He, you know, much in the public eye and I was saying so, so right we'll, we'll see you for dinner when I said I can't I've got to go to India I said what do you mean you've got to go to India he said I'm going on a, a retreat I'm like you're going on I know Richard you're going on a retreat what are you going on a retreat for he said well it's my my marketing team think I need to be seen there because it's more in line with where we want the brand to go I said sweet lord okay that's that that's way off brand for him he said no, don't worry about it um, we've got two weeks booked in uh, a, a villa in Ibiza straight afterwards so we'll normal service for his year. and it's just like that kind of whole corporate manipulation of the market because I think it's going to be you know good, good for the company when in reality the people running it have kind of got there a certain way and maybe that's fine which there's always about in his case making his shareholders money Number one, and making himself money. Number two, and continuing to grow the company. I think if you kind of get down to basics, that's kind of where uh, what people really care about, you know, are you making me money or losing me money? I don't care whether you went to India, and I, you know, and, and I kind of don't care how you package this thing up, uh, make it work quite coldly. But I think that's the reality, and yeah, that's there, there's where we're at. Okay. Um, any ob any further observations from you? Any more yeah. takeaways? I did. I spoke to one copper CEO uh -huh. uh, who said that he had looked around. He'd done a kind of review. He's looking to do some M and A. Uh, he had done a review of the kind of the copper space, and he said that uh, almost every project with copper re resources that they looked at, which was at a reasonable price point, had serious technical problems. And that anything that didn't have a technical problem was kind of much, much more expensive. He also he didn't look at all of the things that were more expensive and say that they didn't have technical problems. But anything that was um, uh, that he could see that was good was a much higher value, which meant that he had two choices. One is to um, overpay or kind of bid high to kind of start to play with the more expensive assets. Uh, or he could trade at the price point, at a lower price point, and had a choice at that level of two two kinds of things. One is a kind of a slightly problematic asset, which he could try to unlock, or he could take on a good asset, but with less uh, certainty because it was not properly or fully de-risked, i.e. still in the exploration stage. So I thought that was quite interesting, that if you can take a copper asset and it's good, then it's going to be valuable. It may also maybe think about market efficiency. You know, uh -huh. can you find things which are undervalued in the market? Because in that sense, it felt as if the market is quite efficient. If it's good, it's expensive. If it's not good, it's cheap. Um, I like to think that the work that we do um, in industry and, you know, in crux, for example, is that we get enough information from the CEOs and from the companies to be able to say, this is going in the right direction. It's partially de-risked at the moment, but I think in three, six, nine, twelve, whatever months ahead, it's going to be in a greater, uh, in a position of greater certainty, and therefore it's going to be worth more. Yeah. And I think that's a that that kind of uh, justifies the entire investment thesis. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, they they should they they I mean they they should they should be efficient, but it's been a kind of wild ride for the last three years. And um, what I think what I'd like to see is the market being highly efficient and helping us sort the wheat from the chaff and removing a lot of the the companies which just have never never really been goers, but because of people like hanging on to investments made in twenty twenty twenty. 
2021 and they didn't want to take the losses i i would kind of like people looking at the start and go do you know what enough's enough here well I'll, I'll take i'll take the hit i'll sell for a loss or i'll, I'll sell for a total loss in, in some cases i suspect um and get behind good companies i don't know how many, how many conversations we've had how, how many articles we've written got to um you know if you want to be a contrarian investor, you know, go go and do your homework and pick the right companies. Um, stop backing losers on 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 on, on sentiment basis. Um, so that that's the, you know, for me, that's what I like to see in terms of you know that aspect of market efficiency. I like the market to say we're kind of sick of the you know the freeloaders, the lifestyle companies, the people who don't know what they're doing, and and let's kind of have a clear out and maybe hopefully we can sort of start from a, 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 a better place um, in terms of investing into genius. Well, there you go. I mean, you, 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 you makes your bet and you takes your chances kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, but, then, in, in, but, I know, but that's fine. But don't sit and whine about it incessantly <laughs> on, on, the, on chat rooms and social media about this company did that and they did it. What the fucking hell were you expecting them to do? You backed a bunch of never been there before people making it up or, or, and learning on the job management with a crappy asset one you, with this with not a lot of work you could in, F, in a bit of effort you could have worked that out you knew what you're getting into and you said well sort of well just maybe just in case okay in that instance you make your bed you lie in it sort of thing but don't sit and bitch about it afterwards just because you got it wrong and you don't want to admit that you got it wrong that's what i was saying so much of it's so boring it makes you sound stupid just stop just yeah, I mean, stop if if a company is annoying you and that you think management is bad Trot sell on. sell and find Trot something on. that you like um yeah and then don't invest in that same similar style without care or attention to your own money your family's money don't be so goddamn casual about it okay if you act like a man if you want to if you're going to be the be the guy who makes that decision based on not a lot of work. Be a man about it and just get you know take the hit and move on. Um, it's no one's fault but yours. Don't pretend it's someone else's fault. Okay. Sorry, I <laughs> you got me going, but it's 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 it, it, it just it just it just winds me up. I just see there's too much bleating out there. And these are, this is your decision. No one else's. It's your money. No one else's. These are your decisions, and you're either. If you've not got the ability to do that kind of assessing, go get an ETF. Put the bulk of your money into ETF. Well, don't invest. See, even better. You know, then you have nothing to worry about. You're clearly risk averse. Or you sort of sorry, you're clearly uh no, you don't mind a bit of risk, but with that comes responsibility of taking it on the shoulders when it goes horribly wrong, because the markets are not fair. Um all of the time and you've got to work out when to put your money in and take your money out or just you know what you're going to what thematic you're going to back which companies which management teams which assets do the bloody work if you can't you can make that someone else's problem that said i've probably got a lot of stake for that one but um i think the vast majority of the silent majority will be going yeah i, I get that and and i think it's really important to remember that the fledgling companies with a sub fifty million dollar market cap, are much much more fragile. Yeah, much less likely to to succeed. I mean, maybe in today's beaten up market, maybe the threshold is thirty million dollars. But when you look at a very blocky share price chart, and it's a micro cap, it's really really difficult to see a way through that thicket of kind of all of the ma kind of maturation, all the kind of the progress that a company needs to be able to do to kind of advance to the next stage. Yeah. Um, and I've just been looking at the list of the kind of the seven companies that I interviewed for Crux in PDAC. Um, and the I saw Pan Global, Good Benton, Good. Um, Benton Resources, um, Stephen Steers, mm -hmm. uh, Max Porterfield at Callanex Mines, Good Asset, um, Mora, Mora uh, Colbert, um, and, and Anna Hatchet, Dryden Gold, Dryden Ten Gold, Potential. Potential, yeah. Um, Dan Noon at G2 Goldfields. Very good. Tara Christie at Banyan. Very good. Gold. And yeah. Noah Lithium, um, Gabriel um, Rubacha. Don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. In Argentina. And when I look through that list, I, I kind of think to myself, what do I like? I like grade and I like um, grade. Um, 
and I like grade. What about grade? <laughs> uh, I also like grade, um, and I also yeah. like a bit of um, a bit of scale potential and a kind of a decent market cap. And for me, sure. um, I mean, Banyan Tara Christie is really, really impressive. Class uh, act, very, very class act. But yeah. I prefer um, G two Goldfields because they've got the grade and um, yeah. I just, I just love that kind of discovery. Well, they, they've, they've got both, haven't they? They've got, yeah. they've got the yes. high, higher grade. He knows what he's doing. He's got a team and knows what they're doing. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of inevitable, inevitable, yeah. right? Um, yeah. D risk to hack and perhaps not seeing the the value that it should right now. Let, let, I haven't checked since the gold price went up, but I, I assume that, that will have helped them somewhat. Yeah, I mean, um, so G2 is trading at $180 million. Uh, no, sorry, $166 million Canadian. And Banyan's at $100 million. But you see, these two companies are, they're already out of that micro cap. They're already attracting yeah. institutional investment. You know, they've, yeah. they've kind of, they've made it to a degree. Yeah. And then the, then the next lot down are, you know, th but in the 30s. And that's um, Benton and Pan Global. And both yeah. of those are... Uh, Good shot juniors with much more risk to them, but you know they're both copper, a bit of gold, tin with Pan Global, and a bit of zinc with um, I think with um, Benton. But nice, but yeah. both of them are nice, but they're much higher risk in a sense because yeah. you're you're earlier stage. Yeah, and no, that, that's, that's that's part of the risk assessment when you when you when you're looking at these things. But but, the, but there, there but there is the, the it's the list of things you need to check out and be able to understand how to. You know, validate them, whether it be through peer analysis or, or, or whatever mechanism that someone's told you you should use. You got to spend the time to do it, you know, and you know, and and look at where the where the management has been before. Have they done it before? You know, have they been able to navigate this market without absolutely drenching the the shareholders um, in terms of dilution? So, I, I don't think it's hard. Well, I'd like to think it's not hard, but may maybe there's a lot of people out there who who know what the words are, but don't necessarily know how to, you know, into, you know, put them in the right order in in a sentence. And I think if that's the case, make more time for yourself to yeah, learn well, how could, to do that. Um, I may maybe I've got um, cry for help. Cry for maybe help. I've got thirty years of experience in the sector, um, but um, Tom Abraham Jones from Pulsar Helium. Um, I've um, known him and the, his companies for years, and I haven't wanted to invest. But when I when he told me the Pulsar story, I came on. I did a, an interview with him for Crux, and I said I like this, and I'm probably going to have a tickle. And I put a small amount in. He's made a discovery, and the share price went up five times. So, I, what's that? A four bagger? Yeah, that's um, quite that's quite impressive. It, you know, but you know, you, if you look in the background, he's also then for a small company gone and deployed ninety grand on three promotional marketing firms in the US. It kind of helps, right? So you got to you got to look at what, what it, it doesn't. Know. It doesn't. I think it's the, that that discovery well, you know, that first well was what what done it. Results won out. Gone. One well. One well. He did one thing well. But um, uh, yeah, I like. I, I think. I think it's come so sort of clear in in the, in the last in the market over the last three years. You know where we've made our money, and it's and I kind of like the formula, and I think that we'll probably stick stick to that. And and I think one well companies aren't in that formula, so we shall see. I wish you well with your investment, but not for me. Not for yeah. me. No, I'm already recycling. Good. Well, you've got to be able to get in and out. So presumably, it wasn't that big stash no. of cash, right? No. Okay. No. Yeah. No. See, see, that's kind of lucky for you. You know, you 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 get to do that. Like, if we if we do it, I don't want to have like 150 investments. I think we've got, you know, bigger, big, you know, bigger deployment. Hold, hopefully, holding for longer because less work to do. I mean, that's we prefer that, right? But then getting out of something quickly when you've got a, a stack of cash in it, eat. Is much harder if the liquidity is not there, or if the market does something crazy. You're 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 you know increasing your likelihood of failure. So we, I think, for us, it's definitely got to be um, the ability to get, you know get out quickly if we want to. But I think get into something that where we hopefully sit on it a while and let the management do what they get at, where they've done it before. I like. And 
prefer that. And Matt, just kind of coming over to you, you know, in yes. your PDAC, you saw probably Lots. seven or eight seven or eight companies a day for for four yeah, or five it was days. Brutal. It, uh, it was, was brutal. brutal for you. I'd come in, you'd like kind of be slightly kind of stunned having been in that seat for yeah. uh, five, uh, you know, hours at a time. Um, yeah. What, but you, you know can... what? But I love it. I, I, lo- I have to say, I love it. It is pa- it is painful for short for a short period of a few days, but I love it. We learn more for our investing, meeting these companies, speaking to these companies every day that we possibly could. Certainly, than I possibly ever did when I was back in banking days, when I was sitting in a room and they're sort of effectively reading out reading their presentation to me. And um, we met some super companies here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of them in a second. Um, I also was reminded some of the ones I don't need to ever see again. That's fine. Um, we've got lots of those. What are we up to now? Up to two hundred twenty well, well, companies blacklisted. Blacklisted, uh, as in if they if they say they want to come on, you say I'm terribly no, sorry. No. It's like no, it's thank not you very much. I'm not going to waste my time or their time or anyone else's listening to it. So we we are very strong on that. Um, Can you share that list publicly, please? Oof. That'd be a bit naughty. I'll share it to you. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'll share it. To, I'll share it with you. Definitely. That, that I think you know quite a few in many ways. I do. But I do. But it would create it would create a Twitter storm if ever that got out. <laughs> oh god, that'd be so much fun. Um, but I think it's obvious to everyone. Like you know, I think it, you know we get enough inbound on on email and um, private chat to know that people can read between the lines if we're doing an, if you or I are doing an interview and the person the interviewee is um making stuff up as they go along i think i think people can read people quite well actually um not all the time i wish or at least if they do maybe perhaps they need to be a little bit more honest with themselves about what they're hearing or listening to right how did i like um mm, i kind yeah. of go in date order so i think i was <laughs> so she's working on saturday was it saturday sunday monday tuesday and wednesday i had thursday off well done, us. Um, so I, there's a there's a company called um, Omai um, with a, a woman called um, Elaine Ellingham. She is also on, on the board of directors of Alamos Gold, big, you know, very very big gold company. Um, her history. I mean, I, I've done a few with a few weeks ago, maybe back in Denver. You know, track record is is, is immense. But they've got they've got this sort of pressure in uh, Guyana. Um, G2 land. Um, and it's a historical, well, actually two two historical pits. And I just think the team that she's put together, the way they're, they've, they're, they are going to go about building this out, thing out with the support of the government and uh, all of those wonderful things that you need in place um, is impressive. But they're, they're early in the innings. So again, something that I I don't think we can invest in because it's just too small. I think it's like 25, 30 million market cap. One of those companies you mentioned just a second ago. Is is, is it Oh My Gold Mines? Oh My, oh my Gold. Uh, yeah, Oh My Gold Mines. That's right. Yeah. That's OMG. Right. Sorry, did I not the, say OMG, o, o, right? OMG is the ticker and it's 44, 45 Canadian. 45 Canadian, right. So whatever that is in, in, in uh, US. Um, oh, Matthew Gordon. Yes. Uh, so it's it's... It's a kind of um, lo- lowish grade in the sense they've they've got um, indicated resources of about one point nine million ounces at about one and a half grams per ton. So I'm not. I think that's probably a bit too low for you. Is that you feeling that? How, not how do quite. You, not right, quite. It depends. It depends. Gram and see, bl- below you hate. Is that right? It's, it's, it depends if it is um, if they're in a historic gold mine. If they're in an they old are. open pit. Yeah, so this, presumably it's the old oh my gold mine, and so there's a big open pit. So to get to the next bit, what they'd have to do is a huge pushback, all go underground. And yeah. either way, it's going to be difficult unless they found more mineralization. So yeah, would, and, 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 and they have, further. They have. They they have. They have been. They have been at it, um, and they've still got a kind of a two and a half kilometer shear zone to explore etc but i just think i like the way she describes it sets it up and talks about her and her team's experience so for a small company it's it was kind of it was kind of interesting um to me i, I have to admit um and i'm gonna go see yeah, energy fuels we, we, people know i love that and, and, I, and i love it because of the the um white mesa mill and i and i'm knowing that lots of other 
uranium wannabe um, producers are going to need what makes them not to actually process that. Or, you know, Mark talked again, just reminding people, he's coming out with a purchasing plan, i.e. I'm going to buy your ore uh, for 50% of, of, of market and I'm going to take all of the upside. Thank you very much. And if you want to ship it somewhere else to get that done, it's going to cost you more money. So you know, your choice is yours. So I, I just like that, the, the, what the mill does. They're also producing from three mines. Um, they've also been selling uh, uranium into the market. They're selling on 250 million bucks worth of cash. Um, everything about it is set up the right. It hasn't had the sex and the sizzle of all of the other big claims from other companies you know, out there. But... It, when it goes, it will it will go. I think when when people the robots are ready, people need to start actually producing ore um, and getting it processed. I think that's that's where we'll, we're going to know who's who. The zoo. There's also other companies talking about claiming claiming of getting into you know um, production. It's what, Q, end of Q3 this year. We shall see. So I think that it's it's a very interesting market, uranium market. We've done quite well out of it. I don't think uranium uh, energy field's gone yet, but I suspect it will soon. Well, I was, um... So you've spoken so far about you know two companies you've seen on the Saturday that you liked. One was a gold company, uh, an exploration gold company, and the other is a uranium company. Can I just kind of turn it around a bit and just kind uh, of say, um, I take it from the way that you've been interviewing and and uh, speaking over the years that you're overweight uranium. You know, you've been kind of long uranium, and it's been a kind of a, a you, you were, from what I can tell from your portfolio, and I, and I don't have privy. And I'm not privy uh, to it, but it seems to me that you've been quite long lithium and quite long uranium, and you've been quite underweight in gold. Correct. We've made we we are heavy on uranium, have been for four years. We took some profits and then went straight back in. We, you know, we we it's it was, it's good. We probably you know if, if we get back up to where we were, we've made not, we've made twenty percent or so on that. So it's a nice little thing. Trial, see how we did. Lithium, we were long on, um, but you know, beginning of last year, we were like, "This is nuts." We got out, we did extremely well. We did extremely and well. Just in the context of the companies that you've seen, were there any kind of uranium companies that were going to kind of um, make you change your mind? Either on the kind of uh, let's not get on the negative, but you know, was there anything else which you just thought, "Oh, I must have more of that in the uranium space," or is it more or less just kind of keeping things? Um, the furniture on the deck um, as it is. We we didn't we didn't we didn't um, pile into. Look, we we always we always buy, so we, nothing changed in the sense of we'll be pick, picking up you know, bits and pieces here and there. But we didn't pile into, into too many new stories. I think we're happy with the ones that we've got, um, and it's all that to be correct. Uh, I say exploration just isn't our exploration. Small expert, it just isn't our thing. Um, okay, so I've I've got a tiny position in um, a couple of uranium uh, explorers, and who, uh, who have you got? Um, f- um, base load and um, Can Alaska, and Can Alaska has come up with a kind of a stonker of a hole. They 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 have, and again, I'm waiting to sort of see what that what that what that happens. It's obviously it's quite deep. Yeah, you know, very very deep. Um, considering, and I'm, I'm just look. I'm considering. Um, kind of doubling up on that success and kind of swapping out um just kind of rearranging the the furniture on the deck kind of reducing my base load and increasing my can alaska because i well, i saw I, 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 yeah. I saw um cory bellick and he he had that look in his eyes that geologists get when they're, they're they're onto something well that's great i think i would, I would yeah like say you know what the the, the the one old companies don't do it for me like i would need to look at any other drilling that they've done Side that hole and sort of see what see what they're looking at, yeah. But it's expensive drilling for a start. Uh, it's because it's deep, um, and I'd like to see you know what the nearest hole came up with because we didn't hear much about that. I'd like him to come on and talk. I mean, what I'd like to do before I do anything with is speak to him properly because I only had five minutes with him in a, or two minutes in a coffee um, queue at BDAC. But yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, so we'll we'll, we'll yeah. But um, That's gold. Good. Well, what, cool, what's cool, cool. But yeah, back to the second bit of your question, which was yeah, uh, yeah, and I, and I pretty much told everyone at PDAC that you know we were in, out of gold for three years because uh, it just hasn't been pretty. It didn't. Look, my my problem with gold three years ago was I expected it with my banking hat on to behave a certain way because it always did, and it didn't behave 
as predicted, as expected. And that made me nervous. So I got the heck out of Dodge. So we dumped all of our gold stock and thank the Lord, as it turns out, uh, we're able to deploy it much more profitable enterprises as a result. But 2024, and maybe I missed the boat with this 150 million, but 150 bucks increase. Um, there we have it. It's, it's, it. it doesn't seem to have rippled through just yet. If we can see a sustained gold price at these sorts of levels, and indeed, if it goes again, I, I think we are right in, in our assumption that for 2024, we will be investing in gold again. Um, we're making a call of, you know, 2450. Um, and if that's the case, I think some of the producers are safe bets, very safe bets, and probably should do exceedingly well in terms of free cash flow. Uh, and some of the developers, likewise, will be the beneficiaries of, of that. Um, did um, did any of the companies that you interviewed kind of get make it onto a radar screen or kind of onto an um, approved shortlist? Approved short in, in in the context of gold. Yeah, um, in the front context of gold, um, we we ended up we saw we saw quite a few you know small companies unfortunately you know we you know the I think Dryden which I think you did but we I, we spoke to you several several times. Um, and the, and the like, where it was a bit problem. But I saw, I think um, Ari over at uh, Collect- is it Collective, Collective, is it- Collective. Yeah, he was Collective. I think I yeah. I love what they're doing and the way that they're going about it. So uh, you know, they're they're on the list uh, for sure. Erdine, Erdine oh, Resource yeah. Development, yeah, 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 Mongolia, just solid. I mean, possibly, and he will admit it himself, a little bit. Conservative and a little bit dur CEO, but um, what they have done there is not recognised. They and they then and the and the joint venture they did um, in country was just fantastic. So Peter Ackerley, I think he's called. Um, in fact, next time they come on, you you, you should do the interview. Because well, I've done I've, I've done I've done one with him before, and I like and ah. I liked it. I did it a couple of years ago, and he's got grade and scale, and yeah, I, I yeah. you know I really liked it, although. Uh, it was out of favor, juris- jurisdiction yeah. wise. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I haven't yeah. seen what progress they've made. But it's interesting to hear you talking about it with um, kind of a smile in your voice. Yes, yeah, smile in my voice, and also the which is because I because I I feel kind of gold and silver will start to move through the phases. And there's another guy I saw, um, Lance Shaver over at Silver Corp. Now they're in an interesting situation um, where they have put a Bid, it made a bid for, um, I think it's called Ore Group. And Ore Group have got a project in, in Australia, with a company with a good project in Tanzania. Um, but um, Perseus Mining have also put a bid in, for, and also well, it was quite stealthily picked up 19.9%, well, I think, on routes whilst, whilst, whilst um, bidding against uh, Lot. I don't think if Silver, Silver Corp, because they've, they've got projects, um, the Lin, Lin Project, Lin region in China. So people look at this China thing going, eh, I don't think so. So they're not getting full value, but they are banging out gold and they are selling gold and that's great. And they know how to mine. That's great. Um, I think they're looking to diversify and de-risk jurisdictional de-risking um, by picking up this asset in Tanzania if they can. I think there's going to be a, a tough, tough one, quite frankly. But I like Lon. I like the, the, the team. I like the ambition. And they've got a big kind of cash reserve obviously building up as they as they sell um, you know their their product in the market. So yeah, that that that's another one. I kind of was like, I might have a hang have on. A, and the, go um, at this. Is All Corp the one with the asset asset in um, um, Tanzania? Tanzania. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a gold. It's a gold asset. Gold, but they haven't quite. Yeah, they 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 need they need money. They need a bigger company, but bigger yeah, yeah. They're they're, they're yeah. great guys. They're they. I know the guys behind that. They're super 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 South guys. African. No, they're um, British and Australian. Oh no, but the CEO is South African. Um, of Orcorp or Group, I think it was, isn't it? Or Group. Orcorp, 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 maybe. Um, yeah. Silver Corp buying a gold asset, another really well-named company. I think when you name a company, should what you should always do is try and make sure that you get the commodity in there and the geographies, just so that you really got flexibility about what you do on a corporate level. Ah, oh, have you have you seen this new company, Commodity Resources? <laughs> Yeah, you ever seen them yet? You are kidding. You're not kidding, are you? You're not kidding. Oh, 
I'm yeah. kidding. They're doing a roll up of all the <laughs> all the commodity companies. It's, it's, it's world commodity. That's what it should be called. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I know you're pulling off for a, a badly named uh, company. Oh my god, uh, it gives you something to grumble about at Christmas. Yeah, it does. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so those, those are kind of like in terms of gold, goldy ones. In, in terms of more. Um, more broadly, in terms of other companies, I saw I saw some cute little stories, but Jesus, you know, what, it's 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 one of those. It's one of what, those. What were the nickel companies um, CEO saying, apart from Mark Selby, or maybe just summarize his view? Um, I had some good conversations with Mark recently, and I think there we'll, we'll put some links in here for sure. And just talk about the, the market and uh, his view on uh, research companies in the market uh, and behavior of certain companies like BHP in the market. That's his views. But you know, we saw we saw some smaller companies like um like Magna Mining. Um they're oh, yeah. they're gonna get and this is I tell you what, this is a theme I I've been seeing, you know, pre PDAC, but you know, in it, this new year, but um which was just companies changing business models. I kind of like that, right? If you've had three years of eating dirt, you and you said, you know what I'm gonna do in twenty twenty four? Nothing new. You yeah. have got something Coming wrong back with you. For third and fourth helpings. Yes, yeah, so I want a darn good spanking, you know. And it's like, no, think about it a different way. And I've seen companies like, um, uh, you know, like uranium companies, like, I've been trying for four years to make a discovery. I haven't been able to. What do I do? What, what, what do you do? You become a prospect generator. So I've seen two. Uranium companies go to that model, so you know there's there's not uranium everywhere, and not everyone makes discovery. In fact, that that that's a rule in mining, um, and certainly not economic ones. So they changed their business model from being an explorer to being a prospect generator, and then doing deals with other companies on the mm. assets in the portfolio. Smart. I mean, you have a bit of that with Salazar, right? With with yeah, but crikey, it's hard. It's hard because it's effectively hard. being a prospect generator is the is it's the front end of making a discovery. Um, so it's all the same skills, and my goodness, it's hard. It's hard, but it's better than dying on the vine, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's your option. Yeah. So I, I can't raise any money. I can't do any drilling. I'll never make a discovery. Uh, so look, I will. Uh, you can say anyway. So there's that. Uh, Magma, similar. They are doing a similar thing. They are um, effectively trying to get into early production. I know how you feel about this. It can be the most inefficient thing in the world. Um, but it can also, it can also. I'm being waved to by my gardener. I, I think I think I'm gonna have to, gonna have to let him do his thing. God knows what I'm gonna walk out to later. Um. So, so 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 I I, I kind of I, I that getting into production early to generate some revenue because I think there's another one called Outcrop Gold and they raised some money off the back of PDEC as well to do this. Saw a press release this morning. Where they have, and he whipped out a kind of little silver, piece of silver like this, where it's they will generate enough cash from getting into production with the facilities that they've got to keep, you know, maintain keep- the GNA and exploration. And you go, <laughs> bravo. <laughs> Bravo. Well, they won't. They Bravo. won't. They'll be like hamsters on that door, on that wheel. They'll yeah, keep enough. Yeah. They'll generate enough money to pay the yeah. GNA. Oh, and we'll just keep going. We'll just keep going. Oh, well, we just got enough. There we you can go. Just do a little bit of development in front of our nose, and oh, we can keep running on this hamster wheel. I know. I know. You 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 called that with um. I think you called that with Sarabi Gold, didn't you? To with me three years ago. Yeah. Maybe even longer. Yeah. 2019. You said that to me. You said like this is kind of this case of hamster running on the wheel and then then they got hit with COVID as well so it wasn't just a COVID thing it was a it was always destined to be thus but um I'd like to I'd, I hope I hope Sarabi has turned the corner it looks like perhaps finally you know with a second asset they might have and I think with the JV that they've done they they might have turned the corner but yeah so I, I said so that's that's what I was seeing quite a bit of um at at, at PDAC and, and 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 obviously before that, where you've got people saying, "Well, look, we we've got to we've got to change this up if we are one to survive, um, and to to you know you know I guess pay salaries. I mean that's that's the bottom line, right? That's yeah. all the kind of people care yeah, about. You, but um, because these companies they effectively have to rip the plaster off at some stage. I think so. And like I say for me, I said right at the start of this conversation, I I hope the I hope the market 
um, I hope the you know market that he, I think he was on market efficiency, and I, I may perhaps wander vaguely in that direction. But I hope we see a bunch of companies get bought up, merge, die, whatever. We've got way too many companies, you know, trying to push crappy assets. The amount of I've said this for again for three years. You know, the amount of silver projects out there it's that just Quite frankly, one, we don't need that much silver, and, and, and two, most of you guys just haven't got anything decent anyway. Um, and it gives a chance for silver price to actually may, 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 maybe go for a run with gold this year. We, we shall see. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to think. The one, I, the one I did like doing an interview with, and I've not spoken to him since, I don't know, maybe three years ago. So he's a guy called Evie Tucker. He was like a used car salesman for me. It's, mm. just, it's all very retail, pumpy, dumpy for me. And, uh, they got blacklisted. Um, I was like, I'm just not interested in this. Um, and there, but they their share price then ran. So it was which company? I, Metalla Royalty. Uh, Metalla Royalty and Streaming, I think they're called. Yeah, um, was it Metalla Royalty? Maybe now. Anyway, it, it was it was one of those ones where it was just you know the market got carried away and excited about royal, new royalty companies, and and it really did quite well for a period of time. And there. Um, CEO um, Brett came and joined me, and I, perhaps I don't think they've liked some of the things we've said about them in the past. So I was sort of intrigued at one, why the hell would you come on? Um, and two, what were they going to say? And I, and, I, and, I, and I kind of, they have lost a lot. Of, I mean, their share price over the last three years is a joke, you know, down, downhill ski run, right? But he kind of came on and he, he was, he was, I mean, I couldn't help but the way this conversation, I couldn't help but ask him, I said, do you feel you've grown up? You know, and by that I meant, as in, and you stop sort of dicking around with the market and realize you've got a, a valuable company here and start marketing properly. And, they, and I think they've kind of stood EB Tucker down from marketing and trying to get a little bit more grown up about it. And I, I, that kind of impressed me, if I'm honest, because well, they've, I, um, especially if you, You've beaten up on the company a few times. Um, I know how scary you can be, Matt. Um, oh, stop it! And no, well, it's, you know, some CEOs are kind of come on with a degree of trepidation because. Oh, yeah, it, I, did, it, it, I, did, I did have I did have one say that to me. He said, "Do you know? Do you know? I have a full on panic attack every time." And they weren't kidding. Every time we're doing an interview, and so that's why I've cancelled a few times. And I'm like, "What are you, what are you talking about?" I mean, literally, these people have the answers in their heads mm. already. I'm just asking questions about stuff they already know about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, it'd be like me asking a question on sheep sharing. You've got all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, don't yes. worry about it. Yeah, animal don't husbandry and me. It. Yeah, I know. We're right in there. Animal husbandry. Yeah. Um, but I, but I don't know. As I say, so Metalla kind of like I say, it's it's come from a, 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 a um, low in my estimations to actually I say good 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 on you for coming on. And by the way, well done for what I'm starting to see in terms of the way that you're you're talking about it. But you know, I think for some shareholders, it's been long suffering and it came in a lot higher. Perhaps there's still a few grumbles about the, the company. But I maybe give, give them a chance. Give them a chance. Good. And do you think? Um, Companies are going to spend on marketing this year. Do you think you're going to have a kind of a full load of um, crux interviews, or is it going to be um, uh, only the successful ones are going to stick their head above a par the parapet? Well, here's a, here's one for you. I think there's there's lots of online uh, interviewers, and and that's great. You know, we, I've seen a few um, people. Who, here's the UK, the kind of preeminent UK one, of the big for, for the, one of the first guys that did interviews. Been around for about ten years. Crikey. You don't know how I mean, do you? Um, you must have been interviewed by them. Proactive. Anyway, proactive. There you go. And I think one one of their one of their main interviewers has kind of gone for several of his own companies. He reached out to me on um, LinkedIn yesterday. This week. And but you know, when I sort of so, so when I when I there's basically there's a lot of online interviews, right? So companies got a lot of choice. And maybe people are a little bit bored. But I tell you what. It's bloody efficient, right? Because, you know, um, and I say this in context of an interview that we did. We sent out a questionnaire to 3,000 companies. Well, we've got about 300 back, which is like, that's not bad. I'll take that. That's really good. The question was about how they spent their marketing money in the context of um, conferences. So some simple questions in that. 
How many conferences did you attend last year? On average, eight. Some people, 16. Which I thought was spectacular. That doesn't. That did not include town halls and stuff like that. So you've got to market. And you know, whether, whether um, retail investors like it or not, if companies don't market themselves and don't get heard, they're not going to attract investment. So it's a necessary evil, I imagine, it, how they would view it. And some people just go, why are you wasting paying you know, for interviews? Why are you paying for conferences? It's part of it, right? So you need decent management team, decent asset, access to capital, and the ability to you know, sell your stock, right? This is kind of simple stuff. Um, and the, so, okay, how many conferences? Average eight, as, as far as 16. Um, were these good value? Resoundings or something like in the high high eighties. No, because there were no investors going to conferences, right? So not only do retail not do jump on an airplane, book a hotel, and attend a two day conference, but institutional guys would also the same way. It's like, well, there's nothing happening. Why the hell would I spend you know business class flights and five star hotels for my people in, in in banking to to go to meet these companies who should come and see us quite frankly they weren't doing that either so no the companies were saying it was not a good return on investment fine how many conferences will you be attending this year in the new year hey this is now 2024 say overwhelming same as same. last year <laughs> i'm trying that's the bit that gets me it's like so you're telling me it wasn't worth, uh, it wasn't a value for money, but you're going to do exactly the same thing again. Genius. So coming back to the online thing, do we think we'll see more more marketing online this year? I think we'll, we will, we hope we'll see more marketing online, but I think there's going to be a lot less companies. I'm hoping so. I don't, I don't really mind if we see less companies. That's absolutely fine. Um, I want to see good companies because those are the ones that I make money on. Like yep. going and interviewing a bunch of, shit goes don't care I, I literally i would roll up stay in bed you know uh, in the morning or i'd write i've got other things to things to do you know we do have investments to run um so i want to see more good companies this year that's our that's our kind of key uh driver for this and year basically what you're articulating there is that the crux interviews that you do are an essential part of your family office due diligence oh. process I mean, I say I've said this on the um, the private platform, you know, the pay for platform um, previously, where because um, people are quite right, they say, "Well, what the hell are you doing these interviews for? You're you're, you're managing a ton of money, you know, for your own family. Why would you do this?" I said, "Because we are better investors now for having done this." Which means that anyone watching our videos or, or others, there are other key, key interviews out there, not many, but there are some, um, and. Our returns now, compared to our returns back in the banking days, I think our best year in banking, we had a 14% return. Yeah. Our best year. So it was very cautious stuff. But that's kind of where we were at, right? Very very sort of cautious, conservative, et cetera. So we weren't like, you know, hoping to knock, knock something out or knock it out of the park. Just like we just needed to make money every year. The, you know, these days, you know, we saw in 2020, like, you know, plus 300%, 2021, plus 300%. I think 2022 is a bit, you know, a bit down. It's sort of like we doubled our money, right? Uh, last year it was tougher, but we still doubled our money last year, right, across the board. So we've had some absolute belter wins, and we've had some others which, you know, where we, unfortunately, wish we had deployed more capital, but we've had, you know, some not so good ones and we're sort of still, still sitting on those hoping that they'll come out the other side but that's the benefit of sitting on these things being able to sit on these things for a longer period of time so it, it, it's been tough out there but it's been slightly skewed by this sort of mental 2020 and 2021 period where there's money being thrown at utter rubbish and everything rose collectively undeservedly um, and I think we're sort of seeing some of those kind of you know fall by the wayside so it, it, it's it's a fantastic mechanism for learning because you're speaking to CEOs directly, looking at their body language, looking at the, what, what, how they answer the questions. Are they answering the questions? Are they capable of answering the questions? Yeah. Right? Um, so that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful tool that then we have to go away and go and look at all of the, the, the financials, you know, look at the reports, the 43101s, you know, the quarterlies, et cetera, and go, 
is this evolving? Is this moving? Am I I'm tracking it? And is it moving forward? Is there, is there a growth story here? Has it got momentum? Has it got momentum? So I don't mind coming in a little bit later. No problem with that. Oh, you missed all of the upside at the beginning. Don't worry about, you know, if they say, oh, we're, are we at bottom? I'm going to invest when we're at, bot at the bottom. And like, find, find some good assets and invest in good assets over time, which you think will actually have a chance of getting into production or being bought, you know, either for perfectly good, acceptable right. outcome. I've got um, two bits of uh, crux kind of feedback for you. Yesterday, Ugh. I saw on LinkedIn that someone had kind of, um, blogged uh, what are your favorite uh, interviews on uh, available in the in the resources sector. Here's my top 10 list. And uh, crux was uh, number two in that list uh, yeah. with a commentator saying that you and I did a, a half-decent job. Yeah. And um, I also got an email from a notoriously kind of um uh kind of quite a spiky newsletter writer who 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 wrote to me um oh, uh, after the pan global um interview okay. um, and yeah. saying that despite me not kind of um being a very good interviewer no he didn't quite say that is it he didn't say no he didn't say that he didn't say that he said that i i, I went soft on him you know i didn't Oh really? I didn't go. I didn't go hard on the on Tim. He Moody. didn't keep you hard, no. um, but um, he said the interview provided a useful shopping list of information, which I think. Well, the, well, which is which is quite nice. I think I know who you're talking about, and and you know he's a bloody good writer as well. But it's just a, all this aside and commentary is this is this slightly you know yeah. offensive. But again, I don't care. It doesn't change my waking day. But he, he, he if he stuck to what he was really good at, he would do extre extremely well. Um, but it's it's. Um, but I think that's our style, basically. You know, you've, you. Well, it is the style. But, but here's the thing: people need to understand. It's like, okay, we used to be known for being a lot harder and a lot tougher. But guess what? Those company CEOs didn't come back, so we got net. We don't have a chance of actually learning. So I'd rather kind of go have had the odd barbed and stinging uh, question in there than at 100 percent of the time, because you want these companies to feel pushed and. You know, slight, you know, slightly awkward, but not to the extent where they, you tell their IR teams never again. It's, it does, that's no good for us, right? So we've got to get that balance between being forceful and being like, I would, what I call, I call it being pleasantly aggressive. That's a phrase. I, I always say right. to them at the start of an interview, I say to make it more genuine and more real, I have to ask the difficult questions. So I'm going to ask about. Your cash position, yeah. or the social thing, or the the share price, yeah. but that's yeah. gonna that has to be part of the conversation, or otherwise it's oh, absolutely it's just a puff piece. Absolutely, and and I'm talking of puff piece. That's why I was trying to remember the name of proactive. Is like the guy sort of trotted off. Um, he he's kind of laughed off where he started, which was so you're building a mine. It's like what the fuck? have you sent these questions in and you know all these things reading from piece of paper, and you could give a shit what the answer is. Do you know? It kind of feels like you know some of these interviewers go through five years of doing it and they don't actually know nor care what the hell the company does because there's pre agreed questions. Um and, and it just I was watching a bunch of them over the weekend. It's like, this is awful. I'm learning nothing. You're wasting everyone's time. But the company feels well, at least I've done an interview. No. Spend your money intelligently. So I think online I think is a fantastic device for spending efficient for reaching the most amount of people in the cheapest possible way and it sits there it has longevity to it i think there are some conferences which are good but you don't go to 16 conferences a year don't be dumb and i and they all say the same thing to me it's like oh there's no one there i was i know but i did get to go and see the gorillas or whatever the hell they were there is i did bring my girlfriends along we went on safari um, you know, it's it, all of that kind of crap's got to go. Is this is shareholder money, not your money? So you know, have a think about how you spend it more intelligently. So I think online is a big part of that. I think the companies need to do more. The websites are, are much better than they were three, four years ago. More of that. They can do their own emails. They can do their own video videos of you know technicals, mm. whatever. It's yeah. all, it's all good. But come and get a real interview so people can really understand whether they like you or not. And I think programs like ours appeal to the institutional guys. You know, we, the you know the the institutional um, part of this. Whether we've got like what four thousand or so institutional guys guys signed up for this, we've got three and a half thousand family offices signed up for this. You know, real people with real money um, actually want to hear 
tougher questions. Uh, and the companies need to get better at telling their story. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to be said about, you know, you know, other people's views on what we should and shouldn't do. And that's great. Crack on and do it yourself. Um, we, we, we do. I, I was surprised, actually. Peter, that's one, actually, that's one takeaway I'd add to your list. A lot of real people, I'm talking about government ministers, a lot of CEOs, and a lot of people who had bothered to turn investors who had bothered to turn up to to Toronto to go to this conference came up to me and were like, "We love your shows. You know what you and Marilyn doing is great. Um, love the tough questions." And you know, to, to hear a government minister, you know, in the, in the mining department talk about us as something that they watch to help them understand the space, that was really quite nice. Yeah, that was really lovely. Yeah. You know? So um, there's a lot of good people watching us, and we need to remember that in between all of the uh, stupid commentary every time we put out a um, a, a analyst note. So, you know, our, our, our analysts stay anonymous for a reason because some of the stupid commentary that comes back from uh, upset shareholders, you know, who should know better. Yeah. In terms of how to behave, but also they don't know enough about the thing they're invested in. They just kind of laughable juxtaposition, but there we go. Um sorry, I've I've waffled a bit there, but I some sometimes I want to Last question, know. if I may. Oh kid goodness gracious, yes. Are you gonna to go to PDSU next year? I really enjoyed it because I yeah. get to, I got to see people have to remember that in real life. Um and that was great. In different sorts of like I say the, the uranium night on the Monday night an invitation only folks um was so much fun there's so many people i'd not met face to face um i was ushered around from group to group uh meeting some fantastic i met you know loads of people from Irano, uh lots of people from kamiko some kazatom prom people there i met some government ministers who were involved there um we met CEO of all, all of the kind of companies I kind of respect and like, you know, I had, had a good chat with that uh, Janet Sheriff, um, Bill's wife, um, up there, and, and 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 lots of fans of uranium. So, and it was a really lovely, charming, relaxed evening for, for a group of people who are the perhaps the only green on the on the board at the time. Um, so, that sounds yeah. like a yes. That sounds like a yes. I think it is a yes, Merlin. I think it's a yes. And then you and I did a little bit of running around with, with our own um, things, didn't we? Yeah, we certainly did. There's lots and of interest in well. that. Yeah, going well. Very, it always, very well. It always helps in exploration when you find the stuff you're looking for. It does. It does. So we shall uh, we shall carry on forward and sort of see where we get to. Um, and that's, you know, hopefully a couple more years drilling and we'll know what, what we've got. But it's looking nice. Looking nice. Right. Merlin, Schmerlin. We're up to an hour and 20. I think we'll have uh, killed off the old folks. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's yeah. a long one. It's a long one. Should Anything we... else you need to say? Get off your chest? No, I, um, I'm i happy and confident in my um, in myself. What's the name of your gold company again? Remind me. <laughs> gold and copper. Gold and copper. Gold and copper. Gold and copper. Hey, pal, stick in your lane. Yeah. Stick in your lane. Gold, Gold. and copper. What's it um, called? Fitzroy Minerals. Fitzroy Minerals. If anyone yeah. would like to take a look at Fitzroy Minerals, Chilean gold, yeah. maybe some copper. Uh, and, and Argentinian gold. We're, we're making a nice um, opening up something quite exciting in Argentina as well. Very good. Good, man. Okay. Well, man, uh, good to speak to you. I'll speak to you soon. And um, have a great weekend. Thanks. You too. Go well.